From the center of the universe, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this is the SDM Show with your host, Rob Cairns. The SDM Show focuses on business, life, productivity, digital marketing, WordPress, and more. Sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the show. Here is Rob. Hey, everybody. Rob Cairns here. I'm the founder, CEO, and chief creator of Amazing Ideas at Stunning Digital Marketing. In this podcast, I sit down with my friends, Danano and Hans Skillrod of Termageddon, and we talk all things privacy and privacy policy. Grab a drink because you won't want to miss this episode, and sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. This episode of the STM Show is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups, being hacked, or your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Hey, everybody. Rob Cairns here. Today, I'm here with Hans and Nato Skillroot of Termageddon. How are you both today? We're good. We're good. Yeah, well, thank you. So I thought I'd get you on and we talk a little bit about Termageddon privacy is and privacy in general. It's starting to run its, I call it its ugly head again, if you can deal with that. Um, but before we do, let me get your background story. How did you kind of get into developing Termageddon and how did you end up into the WordPress space? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a licensed attorney. Um, and before I um, kind of got into privacy, I was in um, private practice. So I was helping my clients with contracts. I was actually working with a lot of agencies for contracts. Um, and they were building websites for their clients. Uh, and they would ask me what they should do for a privacy policy and uh, terms of service. Um, so I started looking into that, and I guess I haven't stopped for the last five years or so. Um, but, you know, I was writing privacy policies in terms of service for my clients. And to be honest with you, I found it kind of boring and repetitive. Like, I'd ask them very similar questions. I had like 10, 15 templates that I would, you know, Frankenstein together. And I guess this is before most of the privacy laws came into place here. Um, but I thought that the process was very repetitive and I thought, Hey, there's gotta be a way to automate this. Yeah. And in my background, I was running a 12 person web design agency, um, full disclosure, we are married. Uh, we're sitting Hence together. Same last name. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I was building websites for clients. Um, and right before site launch, my clients would ask, should I have a policy for my website? And I had no idea how to answer that. I, I, I wouldn't know because I'm not a, a an attorney. So, um, they would ask me to copy and paste templates from competitor websites and things like that. And that just never felt right. Uh, so Donata and I got to talking and, and we built Termageddon um, as an affordable alternative to a privacy attorney. And that's probably good uh, transition in to me saying, you know, please note anything we share today is for informational purposes only. Termageddon is not a legal service provider and we're not providing legal services during this podcast. Yeah. And, and I would agree with that. I mean, we all know what's going on in the world. We've got the issues in Europe with GDPR. We now have the issues in certainly in California. And I think there's another U.S. state that's just ruled its head in the last couple of weeks. Um, certainly issues in Canada with privacy. And I think the issue is people are being more concerned about not just the policy, but what happens to their data and where does their data go? And what happens when their data goes outside of the WordPress ecosystem? Your thoughts? Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned like, you know, the ugly nightmare of, of privacy and whatnot, but when it's all coming down to it, these laws are intended to protect and regulate the data of people's personal information. Um, so like name, your name, your email, your IP address, your phone number, anything that could be used to identify you, I personally like the idea of people getting a right to their privacy. I, I think, in fact, most people do like it, but it is an issue for the people that do have websites because 
I would imagine most website owners out there are not trying to do anything malicious. They're not trying to sell off your data secretly or anything like that. I think most people are, they have a website, they want to generate some business for themselves. They want to, um, you know, send relevant information to their fans and their subscribers and, and all that. And it's just, it, you know, we're kind of at the crosshairs of, of these people getting privacy rights. And then we have an, uh, an ever increasing number of complex rules and regulations we have to deal with. But I would say like all in all people are getting a right to their privacy. I think that's worth something fight. That's worth fighting for. It's just that for people with an online presence, you, you you'd have more things you got to do now, basically. And I think I would agree with you. And then the question becomes, you know, before we even dive into policies and what should go in them and what shouldn't go in them, the question is, are you better off in the WordPress ecosystem are having all-encompassed products to keep your information in the dashboard? For example, one comes to mind is Groundhog for doing email marketing automation. Mm. Are you better off going to outside third-party providers that have their own ecosystems built, which one is better from a privacy perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, for email subscriptions in particular, that tr- typically means that some server somewhere is triggering that email, mm-hmm. um, which to me suggests that in either of those situations, it sounds like data is being shared with a third party to send emails. Um, even if you use, you know, like um, Mailgun or, or or something behind the scenes that triggers emails to be sent out to your subscribers, um, I would really say that it's kind of the same thing. Um, both of those scenarios are where uh, the 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 business the website owner is sharing data with third party email sending tools to send emails out um, to their audience of subscribers. So I don't think there's much of a difference privacy wise in that example. Um, and you know, I will say a lot of people say, "Well, I don't share data." Uh, but actually sharing data is very common in our space. Um, and, and you gave an excellent example right there. Um, and, and what privacy laws, one major part of privacy laws is just explaining to users, hey, we share this data to send you emails. Um, pretty straightforward stuff, but it just has to be disclosed under a, 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 under numerous privacy laws, actually. Yeah, and I really would say unless the services that you're using are self-hosted, it really makes no difference as to whether... Um, you install something through the WordPress ecosystem or you go outside of that ecosystem, you're still sharing that data. And sharing is very different than selling. So sharing, very common. You know, data gets shared with processors to process payments. They get shared with your email inbox when someone submits an inquiry on a contact form and you receive their contact data in your third-party email uh, system. So, um, yeah, I think that helps Mm -hmm. clarify our thoughts. So... Those around the world, we kind of look at privacy policies, and I do, and I I look at Canada, and our privacy policies are national, they're federally controlled. In the U.S., they're mostly, and correct me if I'm wrong, state controlled, if if I recall right. And then you've got the mess over in Europe with GDPR and that whole mess. I, I personally think, and maybe I'm wrong, that GDPR is really the tougher privacy policies out there. Yeah, that's true. And I guess GDPR gets a really, really bad rap. But when you look at what's happening in the United States, to be honest with you, I would rather deal with GDPR than what's happening here. Um, So GDPR is one privacy law that affects um, everyone that either does business in the uh, EU Um, offer goods or services there, or track people uh, from the EU using their website. Um, So it's one set of rules that covers the entire EU. Here in the U.S., we don't have a law like that. So we don't have a federal privacy law unless you're dealing with protected health information, the information of children, um, or financial information like financial services. So we have every single state passing its own privacy law um, to control what businesses need to comply with. Um, And the issue with that is that we're ending up um, with a lot of different requirements. So like California, Nevada, Delaware, Connecticut, Utah, Colorado, Virginia, all of those have their own privacy laws. 
Um, so when you think about it, when it comes from like an operational perspective, I would probably rather have one privacy law um, than, than so many that we have here that we need to comply with. Um, but yeah, GDPR is usually the most stringent requirement, but that doesn't mean that if you're following GDPR, you're compliant with all other privacy laws. So a lot of people think, hey, I'm going to get a GDPR compliant privacy policy template, and that means I'm covered for California. Well, that's actually not true. So California, for example, requires you to disclose whether you sell personal information and GDPR does not require that disclosure. So if you're getting a GDPR template for your privacy policy, you're not complying with other privacy laws, most likely. Yeah, yeah that's so true. And it's the same thing if you're disclosing for Canada, you need to follow whatever the Canadian regulations are. And I think that's where the U.S. is getting a little messy is because it's up to the states. Before it's out, I think you can end up with 52 privacy laws. And that, to me, is a bit of an issue. Exactly. Yeah, that's very hard to manage. Um, and when it comes to policies as well, that's very hard to manage. And I think one thing that I want to highlight here, Robert, that you said that's very, very important is that your policies need to be based on the privacy laws that apply to you. Um, so each privacy law has its own set of disclosures that it requires, and you have to have all of those disclosures to be compliant. So you need to make sure that your privacy policy is based on the laws that apply to you and the disclosures that those laws require. Um, otherwise, it's not going to be compliant. Yeah, it's so true. I can remember in the in the first early days of GDPR, and this going back a couple of years, there were actually North American big name news sites that would block an IP address of anybody coming in from Europe because, frankly, they didn't want to deal with the GDPR laws and the privacy mm. laws concerning. So they just said, oh, forget this. We'll just block them and be done with it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's mostly gone to the wayside now. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that was a, a very big reaction at the very beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And then people kind of started understanding what the law means and what the requirements are and said, hey, instead of, you know, um, not offering this to a very big portion of the world, um, you know, maybe we'll just comply with it instead. Yeah. And the whole yeah. thing's gotten tough for the last while because we've got even now, Apple since last November and Apple Mail and Safari blocking certain tracking cookies, right? So mm -hmm. now the vendors are all jumping in and Google's in the process of working on a third party solution to get around cookies in Chrome and where, where they're going to go. And that's been delayed. So, I mean, we've got vendors jumping in the middle of this, which is just making the whole issue even more complex as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Yeah, it is an ever moving target. Um, and, and, and not only is it ever changing because so many entities are involved with their own initiatives, privacy, you know, privacy wise. Um, but we have, you know, small businesses that are caught, caught in the middle of it um, and having to really, really, in my opinion, just anyone with the, collecting information has to have a strategy uh, with regard to keeping their policies up to date over time, um, it's just going to change. And 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 Donato was kind of hinting at it, but you know, as time goes on, I think it's better to have a strategy to embrace privacy rather than try to avoid it. And I think that's that's what we believe is the future, and that's why we're running term again. Yeah, and unfortunately, there's just no way to run away <laughs> to run away from it anymore, right? No, it, it's so true. And as an end user, you know, I think part of the problem is people's understanding. And in the marketing world, we like to use words like free and um, no cost sure. doesn't come rattle off the tongue as well. And what people need to understand from a privacy perspective, the minute they say, I want that free offer, really, it's not totally free. You're giving up the cost of your email address to get that free offer. And and people need to get off and realize that it's no different than walking into a, a store with a loyalty card that says, if you spend so much, they give you a discount on your next purchase. Well, you're giving up your data on what you're buying, when you're buying, how you're buying, and how much to get that discount. I, that's so spot on, Robert. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think we're 
exiting the free stage and understanding that free isn't actually free. Uh, you're exchanging something for free. Yeah, um, yeah I, I actually have a great example on this one. I was at a craft store yesterday and I, I won't uh, name names here, but they asked me, you know, am I a loyalty member? And I said, no. And they said, hey, do you want to give us your phone number to sign up? And I said, no. Uh, and then they continued pestering me until I said, I don't want my data to be sold. And they're like, no, we don't sell data. So, of course, being a privacy lawyer, I went on to their privacy policy and pointed out exactly where they said that that data is sold. Um, so, you know, they, they try to sometimes um, make these incentives for consumers and, and even providing false claims of not selling data uh, when in reality, a privacy policy discloses that they do sell it. So it is useful for consumers, too. Yeah. And I personally, oh. Go ahead, Hunt. Okay, I'll go. Um, you know, I personally enjoy, I personally appreciate the part of privacy laws in particular that are all about forcing businesses to disclose if they sell information. Sharing, it's, you know, that's great. I think it's good to disclose that, of course. Um, but selling information in particular is what I personally, as a consumer, unrelated to Termigun, as a consumer, I like to know that, you know, hey, if I'm submitting my data here, is that data going to be, you know, popped into a bucket of other people's data and then sold off to the highest bidder? Yeah, next and thing you know, you're getting calls about your car's extended warranty. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's the stuff I, I personally think that's really icky. Yeah. Um, and if it, if you if that is your business model, fine. You, but you need to be transparent about that fact. Yeah. I'll, I'll share with you one of the tricks I do when I sign up for stuff that's not legal. I change my middle initial. And then I, <laughs> I know exactly where the data came from and the wow. offers came from. Nice. So that like is, that. that's clever. There are ways to just determine what you're doing and what you're not doing. So let's jump into, there's two parts. There's a, a privacy policy, and then typically on websites, we put a terms of service. Um, terms, term again and handles both. What's the components of a good privacy policy? Yeah, so when it comes to a good privacy policy, it has to have a variety of different disclosures. So first um, and foremost, whatever, if you're using a generator or if you're using an attorney, regardless of the route that you go, um, you need to figure out what privacy laws apply to you. And then the policy needs to be based around the disclosures required by those laws. Um, so each privacy policy is really different, um, but that's the first factor, making sure it's based on the privacy laws that apply to you. And the second factor is making sure that it's based on your actual business and privacy practices. So for example, if your privacy policy says, we don't, sh uh, we don't share your data with anyone, and it turns out that you're actually sharing data with email marketing providers, things like that. Um, that policy is not compliant then. So you need to make sure that it's actually based um, on your business practices as well. But in reality, the point of the privacy policy is to communicate to consumers um, what data you collect, what you do with that data and who you share it with. Um, in addition to other disclosures, like what privacy rights you provide and to who and how consumers can exercise those rights. And, that, and that's some really good points. And I and I think I would encourage everybody, honestly, to read privacy policies on websites, especially if you're doing any e-commerce or giving up an email address, because the common thing I hear all the time, and having been in this tech space for 30 years, is I didn't bother to read the privacy policy. I didn't bother to read the license agreement. I didn't bother to read this because I didn't want to. And I think that's a bit of an issue too. I think end users need to honestly take the time and find out what's going on. Yeah, and I think um, us lawyers are partially to blame for that too. Um, so I read privacy policies as well because it's part of my job. Yeah. Um, and you know, a lot of them are structured in ways that are really confusing. Like at the beginning, it says we don't sell your data, but when it comes to California privacy law disclosures, all of a sudden they do sell data. Um, you know, or it's very repetitive or it's, you know, set up in a very confusing way where the information that you need is scattered throughout the entire thing. Um, so I think us lawyers are, are partially to blame for the fact that a lot of consumers don't read their policies. Um, but, yeah, that's that's definitely great advice to make sure that you're aware of what's actually being done with your information after you share it with a company. And many um, websites, and I know you're... you're um 
service provides that is a terms of service page. So what's the difference between a terms of service page and a privacy policy and how should that be implemented? Yeah, so the privacy policy explains your privacy practices and a terms of service provides the rules of using your website. So basically the things that can and cannot be done on the website. Um, the terms of service, if you're, uh, if you have an e-commerce website, will often include disclosures about like returns, refunds, cancellations, shipping, um, shipping automatic subscriptions, things like that. Um, it will also help you limit your liability and limit your damages in case something goes wrong on a website. So, for example, if you have links to third party websites um, and somebody clicks on that link and gets a virus, it can help protect you from that. Um, it can also help you determine where you would like to resolve disputes so that you don't have to travel to resolve disputes. Um, and it can help you protect your intellectual property and potentially help you protect from copyright infringement claims. Um, so in terms of service is a great way to kind of keep control of your website and tell users what the rules are to um, using that website. Uh, that That's really well explained. Um, before we move on, I was going to share with both of you a, a really interesting hack from a marketing standpoint, and which I don't know if you know or you don't know, but many marketers do landing pages where they'll run, say, a Google ad to. There's actually an old hack that if and a lot of people are unfamiliar with it, if you put the privacy policy, the terms of service, and the contact links in the footer of the landing page, it actually increases your Google ad score and drops the cost that you pay at auction. For Google Ads, isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's that's great, and I think that kind of illustrates the fact that privacy is starting to become a competitive advantage to companies. Right? If we're yeah. not just doing this to avoid fines and to avoid lawsuits, um, but we're doing this to you know help us with our ad conversions, help us with the number of people that actually open our newsletter because they're the people who wanted it um, mm -hmm. instead of getting it just randomly, right? Um, and there's been quite a few studies showing that um, consumers are looking for this stuff now um, and they're expecting companies to have it and they're willing to switch companies um, if those companies don't care about their privacy. So it can definitely be a competitive advantage as well. Yeah, and one, one, you mentioned newsletters. One of the things I'm really surprised at is they haven't rolled the newsletter rules for most countries right into the privacy policies themselves. I mean, I know in Canada we have very strict privacy policy rules and then we have very strict newsletter rules, but they've kept them separate. And it, it would almost make sense to roll them into one, in my opinion. I think I agree with that because getting newsletters that are unsolicited is part of, you know, privacy violations yeah. or, you know, getting newsletters without your consent, things like that. So I totally agree that they should be rolled together into one. Well, and you think about it, like for the companies that buy sold data and then you start soliciting them, it, and the, the conversion rates they're looking for probably is like hoping that one in a thousand people actually like look at it. Uh, you know, maybe even it might be one in 10,000. So it's spammy by almost by definition, yeah. like it's, it's spammy and consumers are smarter than that. You know, when email first got invented, like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I could see why people probably just opened things and like clicked and maybe got, you know, hacked or whatever. But nowadays, like, I think, you know, obviously spammers get smarter and smarter too, but I would say for the, as time goes on, consumers are going to be smarter about their own data and their own understanding of what happens when I submit my data somewhere, what, what's going to happen next. You know, it's so true. Like in Canada, we have a, a newsletter uh, that governs newsletters called the Castle. Right. And one of the things Castle explicitly says is the only way you can be on a newsletter is A, you bought a product till you opt out. B, you opted in explicitly. Or C, it's politically related. So, i.e., a political party or uh, somebody running for political office. That's it. So, the problem with buying lists is you haven't opted into any of those lists. So, technically, using the emails off those lists is technically illegal. And as a result, you can be fined for doing such. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, higher enforcement of those laws would stop those practices as well. No, I would agree. We've seen some big fines up here, fines up here, Donato, in the terms of a couple million dollars. So we've already seen those fines in Canada. And it seems that 
most people are behaving, I would say, but not everybody. And part of the problem with this whole privacy thing is I don't think the lawmakers in Canada and the U.S. really understand big tech. And so they're trying to govern laws instead of, without educating themselves. And that's a big of an issue as well. Yeah, exactly. I think that there's a lot of privacy laws as well that sound great on paper, but when it comes to actually putting them into practice, it becomes a disaster. Um, like, for example, the California Consumer Privacy Act and its definition of sales of data, right? The definition is so broad that potentially the use of like Google Analytics or ads um, mm -hmm. could be considered a sale. But that's not how consumers view selling data. Consumers view selling data as I take your data and I sell it to someone and they gave me $500 yeah. or something like that. Um, so those disclosures and privacy policies for California's privacy law actually are very, very confusing to consumers um, and potentially detrimental to businesses just because of that one definition in the law. Um, but that law was written in, in about seven days. So I guess we can't blame them too much uh, <laughs> because they had uh, they chose to take so little time on and actually making sure that it was proper. Well, in Canada's privacy law, Pipetta applies to a business the moment they collect one piece of personal information from a Canadian, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, that that kind of helps explain the broad reaching nature of privacy laws. Um Obviously, CCPA is, is you know, certain business thresholds uh, force you into having to comply with that law. But many, I would almost say maybe most, are, are just the moment you start collecting uh, personal information from one person yep. uh, from that state or country or territory. So true. Now, let's jump into your product, Termageddon. Um, it's been a couple of years, I think, since you developed it, if not longer. So you want to kind of walk through the process of how you developed a product and and why? Yeah, so um, six years ago, uh, we had the idea and we got going with it. Um, it was kind of a back burner project. We called it Termageddon, thinking that it wouldn't be what it is today. <laughs> um, uh, but we're very happy that people have been receptive to a you know silly name yet serious product. So. Um, you know, our solution is, um, it's $99 a year. Uh, you go through a series of questions to figure out what laws and disclosures you need, or what laws you need to make disclosures for. Um, and then we ask you the questions under, uh, required under those particular laws. Um, so you can generate a set of policies for a business. Um, and what's cool about our technology is that, you know, not only do you generate your policies, but you actually generate an embed code for each policy. And that embed code is what gets copied and pasted into the body of your policy pages. And that's what allows us at Termageddon to control what that copy says. So when new laws go into effect, we can notify our customer and then, you know, say, hey, we're going to push these updates to your website. And then we push them automatically. Um, so Termageddon is not only a way to get policy, comprehensive policies today, but it's also a strategy to keep your policies up to date over time. Um, and then how we got going, you know, um, I mean, well, we wrote out our user flows. I wrote out all my frustrations as a web designer and what technologies currently existed in the market. And we fundamentally built Termageddon to be client friendly, agency friendly, and lawyer friendly. Um, you know, we're, we have, I think, thousands of law firms using us now. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure we do. Um, and uh, it's been well received by the market in, in, in all three of those sectors, which has been awesome. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we also know our job, which is to monitor this, monitor this stuff and keep our customers up to date. Yeah. And what, what would you say your user base is? If you don't mind sharing, ballpark. Um, uh, we have a we're in the tens of thousands of users that, right, at the time of this recording. That's really that's really great, Hans. And I can tell you, having implemented the policy, and if I'd learned to read a little bit, <laughs> it's really, it's really not that difficult. It takes like literally minutes, and and the embed code makes it so easy because all you do is take the embed code and drop it into the website and it's done. So, that's Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that, you know, with you being a Canadian web agency, I'm assuming you probably had to make 
PIPETA disclosures, which is Canada's privacy law, which is actually a very extensive privacy law that I don't think gets enough credit um, as much as GDPR does. PIPETA is intense as well. Um, so I'd imagine you probably went through quite a few questions uh, through your questionnaire. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear um, that you did take the time to read through it and understand what it's saying and everything. And you know, Donat has put a lot of effort at, in trying to make it as readable as possible. Um, and you, you know, you do have some goals to even make it more readable. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah. So, I mean, with privacy laws being passed um, that require easy readability for policies, that's definitely something that um, we focus on um, to make sure that they they are readable to the average consumer. So it's just a constant, you know, a constant focus. Yeah, and I think it's using the right language so the average consumer understands the language instead of what I call high-level lawyer legalese where you need five lawyers to interpret it, right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. And that's really the goal, too. No, and it's so easy. I mean, I think, uh, you know, you're saying at $99 a year, I think that's really important for somebody to spend that money to protect their business because people spend money in business on things they shouldn't, and then they don't spend the money on things they should. And these are one of the things I think they should spend the money on personally. Yeah, I think so as well. Um, You know, if you can afford to hire an attorney to draft your policies and monitor privacy laws and keep them up to date over time, that's the route to go. You know, we'll always say that a term again, nothing beats hiring an attorney to do all this stuff for you. It's just most people don't have 10, 20 grand a year laying around for such a service. So, we're, we're honored and happy that we have so many people, you know, leveraging our technology um, to help them work towards compliance. Um, it's, 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 it's awesome. It's great. Yeah. So what's next for Term again down the road? So uh, we got a lot of big plans, um, uh, but we are looking to expanding um, into more countries and, and for the countries we service offering more policies. Um, we have some big UI improvements that we're going to be making to the tool um, just based on um, our customer feedback and everything like that. Uh, we're going to start having employees soon, uh, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, and we're going to continue to strive to be the most comprehensive generator in the world. Yeah, and of course, making all the updates for the new privacy laws yeah, for next year, which five. is uh, Quebec, Virginia, Colorado, Connecticut, and Utah. Yeah. Um, so definitely keep an eye out on those. What I'll tell you, Donato, is Quebec, it, it's really funny. You you start reading contest regulations and stuff and having grown up in Quebec, and you turn it over and they say, oh, by the way, here's all the Quebec exceptions. And it's like that with everything in this country. Quebec <laughs> is an exception to every rule under the sun. It's quite... <laughs> Quebec sounds like yeah. the California of Canada. <laughs> my, my favorite part about Quebec is that like for the first like two months after the privacy law passed, the government just like refused to upload the text of the law. So yeah. we had to go like underground to scrounge around for a translation of this thing, um, which was kind of funny. Me and a bunch of privacy professionals got together and like, Somehow we got a copy from somewhere, uh, which is awesome. But the government took a minute to get that uploaded for sure. Yeah, it, it's just an ongoing issue and an ongoing joke. <laughs> I hate to say it. So, uh, thanks for jumping on both here and sharing a little bit about Term again. And if somebody wants to get the product, reach out to either one of you. How's the best way? Yeah, so um, termageddon.com, it's like term age double D for Don.com. So T E R M A G E D D O N.com. Um, and, the, and there's the, you can click the purple register button to get started. Um, and yeah, of course, if anyone ever has any questions, you know, we do have a web design program um, with both reseller and affiliate options. If you do offer websites to clients, um, I, I, I would ask you to check out the agency partners page. And if you're a business or contracts attorney, um, I would love for you to check out the law firm partners page. Um, but if you're a direct customer, you can get signed up for 99 bucks a year and and move on. And, and you can always email us if you have any questions. So Hans, H-A-N-S, at termageddon.com and Donata, D-O-N-A-T-A, at termageddon.com. Yeah, and you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, all that fun stuff at Termageddon, too. 
Uh, choose your spot. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Donato. Have an amazing day. Thank yeah, you thank so you much. Thank you for having us. This episode of the STM show is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups, being hacked, or your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. A very special thank you to Hans and Donato for joining me on this edition of the SDM Show. Thank you for listening to this edition of the SDM Show. The SDM Show is brought to you by Rob Cairns and Stunning Digital Marketing. For more information about Rob Cairns and Stunning Digital Marketing, go to stunningdigitalmarketing.info. From here, you can connect to us on social media, go to our website, and even go to the podcast to subscribe. This podcast is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. Dad, I miss you very much. Keep your feet on the ground. Keep reaching for the stars. Make your business succeed.